So now we're ready to move into our second panel. Sure, yeah. Okay, we've got Dr. Clark Milton. Politics or medicine? Well, welcome. Uh, it gives me a, a great pleasure to be here and talk about a subject that has uh, been of quite interest to me for uh, over 40 years. Now, most of that time, of course, has been professional. Uh, Professor Richardson has made his comments. I will say in medicine that we have a system known as the Health Information Portability and Accountability Act, where we have protected health information. My days in the 70s are also protected information. And in those 40 odd years, that's about 75% of my life. But cannabis has been used for over 5,000 years. That was recently published in the, I want to get this correct, the Journal of Experimental Biology, where carbon dating indicates that cannabis was used uh, 2700 BC. We'll come back to that. It's been used spiritually, medicinally, recreationally for all those years. One would think that with 5,000 years of experience, we'd have knowledge about this budding plant. Unfortunately, we do not. And that's for many reasons. Uh oh, now I gotta figure out how to use this. I should have done this first. Hit the stick. Hit the stick. Where's the stick? Ha! Oh no. Uh, wrong, wrong stick. Ha! Ah, there we go. So we're not very knowledgeable, and there are very various reasons that have been alluded to already about the legality issue and repression of research since the Controlled Substance Act of 1970. And in 2016, we need evidence, we do not need belief. But what we found, and when you look back, there are four areas that consistently come through here. Cannabis has helped with what we just heard, nausea and vomiting, appetite stimulation, particularly in wasting syndromes. We found this in HIV before any retroviral therapy was uh, the, the standard. Muscle spasms associated with neurologic diseases such as multiple sclerosis, and neuropathic pain as opposed to simple nociceptive tissue damage pain. And it was also mentioned that cannabis has been demonized, it's been glorified, and let's face it, most reports are it's pleasurable, it's react relaxing, certainly without the adverse effects of opiates or stimulates. And as we also heard at the turn of the century, uh, the 20th century, uh, tincture of cannabis, cannabis indica, by the way, was part of every doctor's little back bag, then came off of the US Pharmacopeia in 1942, then the Consult Substance Acts, which then made it illegal, Schedule One drug. What does that mean? There's no accepted indication, a high risk for abuse, and a safety profile that's unacceptable, according to the DEA, even under medical care. And so now it was under prohibition, and now it's been remedicalized. I want to tell you all that I have no conflict of interest here other than in my interest in the subject. And my goals are to analyze the impact of the state-based medical cannabis program, review a little bit of the history that's already been done, review the available data, scientific data, and is it popular vote that's leading this or is it evidence-based? The cannabinoid system will be left uh, to Dr. Kinsey. I know that's a lot, so strap in. We're going to go quickly through this. And which was also mentioned before, although Churchill has been associated with this, those who do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. What Churchill really said was, the further backward you can look, the further forward you can see. And that is the truth with cannabis. I always like to give you a little test. We're in a law school here, a college of law. Which of the following plant is most closely related to cannabis? It's hops. And the English in the 16th century referred to hops, oh, I've got to have the quote here. It was too good. That wicked and pernicious weed. Doesn't that sound familiar? And as I mentioned, around the turn of the century, every, little doc every doctor's little black bag had cannabis. There are three species of cannabidaceae, the genera. There's indica, sativa, and rudalis that's mostly in Russia. We've been through this with alcohol. The 18th Amendment in 1919 by the Volstead Act placed uh, alcohol on prohibition. It was shortly thereafter that a group of druggists, brewers, interested stakeholders began to promote alcohol as medicine. In fact, I'm told that's how a lot of these big uh, box uh, pharmacies became uh, popular at the time. 
Then in 1942, cannabis was removed from the U.S. Pharm pharmacopoeia under protest from various groups, including the AMA at the time, and then subsequently the Controlled Substance Act that we'll talk about. As is mentioned, we have 23 states and the District of Columbia that now have medical uh, programs, and the four states now that have uh, recreational use. 2012 was passed in Colorado, initiated in 2014, now Washington, Oregon, and soon to be Alaska. And it's estimated that coming this fall, there'll be at least six or seven more states uh, following this direction, more medicinally. But California is the big area where legalization may be uh, on the front burner. And so for a physician, it's a little unusual. It's a Schedule One drug. I can't write a prescription for it if it was in appropriate state. I write a recommendation. We heard about the ID cards. You don't take your ID card to the pharmacist. You take them to the dispensary where you discuss this with the bud tender. Is that a little problem for me? I'm sure there are herbalists or bud tenders who are very, very knowledgeable. Some may not be, but that's something, I, that's a me problem. And so a little bit of the repression of uh, research has led to the states sort of becoming the laboratories and the citizens, the guinea pigs. It's a little unusual in the year of institutional review boards and approving for research. So all my life's a circle, as we will see, it was legal, illegal, legal, and now this is a picture of dispensary in uh, Denver uh, with recreational on one side and the characteristic green cross of medicinal on the right. It's here to stay, and we'll be increasing, and it's up to us from a medical standpoint to figure out the usefulness. The advocates believe, you hear me believe, therapy for intractable medical problems, it's safety, and it probably is quite safe, and they're effective treatments. The opponents believe the benefits are overblown, they're ignoring the harms, it's a gateway drug, which the Institute of Medicine in 2003 said probably not, we'll look at that in a second, and it may increase the alcohol, tobacco, the Denver experience or the Colorado experience says smoking cigarettes may go up. But one thing for sure, and in West Virginia we're at the epicenter of unintentional opiate overdose deaths, 30 per 100,000, which is a whole different scourge of its own right. But it's difficult to overdose uh, with cannabis. There are three reports in Colorado, one of a slip and fall that may be involved with the cognitive impairment, two, a suicide, and there is a 10% increase in psychosis with the use regularly of cannabis, generally in those who have not been recognized to have a psychosis. And the third was a homicide. Being in the law school, apparently the defense is the weed made me do it. So in any scientific or controversial uh, debate, there's misinterpretation, overinterpretation, and misrepresentation. And currently, there is a huge social desirability bias toward the legalization and medicalization. Gallup polls indicate this is 2013. It was a 58%, but it's over 60% now. Some, as it's alluded to earlier, uh, think that medicalization is really just a dark horse for legalization, and it's about tax revenue. Uh, we'll discuss that in a second. I'm not going to go into detail of the, the cannabis sativa uh, plant, but, but to say there are a number of chemicals here. There are over 60 different cannabinoids. In 1964, we identified delta-9-THC, which is the psychoactive portion, but the more important ones may be cannabidiol and cannabinol. We'll come to that because there was a recent report earlier this week with regard to cannabidiol. It's not new. This is Shang Neng, uh, mystical healer, uh, 2700 BC or before. He reportedly used cannabis for medicinal purposes. This is a sculptor, a sculpture which appears to show the delivery of the pulmonary tree through some sort of device. One would assume that's oxygenation and combustion and delivery of cannabis to the pulmonary tree. This is William O'Shaughnessy who in the mid-1900s was an Irish physician, a per perfect day for him, uh, who was working for the East India Company in Calcutta, who began to report the use of cannabis with regard to cholera issues, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, pain, convulsions, which we hear about. And when he returned to London, it said that he advised Queen Victoria to use cannabis for her menstrual cramps. We were alluded to before from the legal standpoint of the laws that occurred. Remember, at the, 20, at the turn of the 20th century in the US, 
We had 10% of our population dependent on opium at the time. The governments, both state and federal, uh, were trying to get a handle on this. In 1914, the Harrison Tax Act then began to tax the dispensing of opiates. As was mentioned earlier, 1937, the Marijuana Tax Act, that didn't outlaw it, and remember this was Treasury, not Justice at the time, but put a dollar tax on industrial medical use, a hundred dollar tax on an ounce of recreational juice use in today's dollars, that's $1,600 for recreational use, which essentially put it out of business. And then in 1970, the Controlled Substance Act made it Schedule I, and what happened since then it became the number one illicit drug used in America, the second most common violated law, the first speeding. Since 1965, 20 million people have been arrested. Recent FBI data from uh, 2014, about 700,000 arrests. So for a physician standpoint, the lines are blurred here. Is it medical? Is it recreational? Is there benefit? Is there harm? Is there research? Is there draconian restriction on research from the federal government? Is it states legalized, the feds still criminalized, but choose not to enforce it? I feel dazed and confused. And there is the issue of commerce, uh, and particularly as, uh, no offense to our, our legislatures here, but tax revenue is important. And there are significant numbers, as was also mentioned. Who was the first U.S. president to acknowledge having possessed cannabis? Of course, it was Washington with uh, hemp. I try to avoid ideology here. I guess the uh, lower left hand should say Hillary in 2016. But High Times has become, and they are, have a medical issue, sort of the New England Journal of Medicine, and our chief researchers have become Tommy Chong and Cheech Marion. In 2009, the AMA uh, made a statement, uh, and I need to read this, that urged the marijuana status as a federal Schedule I controlled substance be reviewed. That's nothing new. They did that in the 40s. This was taken by the mainstream press to say, look, they've changed. They never changed. But they did forget the rest of the story, with this should not be uh, viewed as an endorsement of state-based programs. So is it safe? Are there, is there uh, evidence to support its safety? We've sort of been through the history here. It is interesting that the federal government's involvement to, dates back to 1906 with the Pure Food and Drug Act, with the precursor of the FDA, which at the time there was no requirements on the people's liniment for man and beast, but after 1906, you had to list if it had opiates, coca, tar, or animal products. In 1936, a small church in the Midwest, I believe it was Indiana, produced a film titled What to Tell Your Children. It was a morality tale about a young man involved in cannabis that led to his demise. I guess the church needed money also. They sold it to an exploitation maestro by the name of Dwayne Esper. Mr. Esper then edited the film, re-marketed uh, as Reefer Madness. It's become the second most popular cult film of all time, second only to what? Let's do the time warp again, the Rocky Horror Picture Show. And this is where most of our information came for years. Interesting, on my life's a circle, by 1931, 29 states had restricted non-medical use, the marijuana tax acts, removed from the pharmacopoeia, and onward to the Controlled Substance Act. 1990, 1972, the National Organization of Reform uh, Laws of Marijuana, or Marijuana Laws, petitioned the BNDD, the precursor of the DNA, the Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs, to get it off Schedule I. As we heard from Professor Richardson earlier, these cycles have gone through various appellate courts, and I believe in 2012, it was upheld to maintain it at the discretion of Schedule I. How is cannabis used by the Office of Strategic Service in the World War II, 1937, St. Elizabeth's Hospital, Washington, D.C., Augusto Del Greco, who was a lieutenant for the Lucky Luciano uh, group of uh, mobsters in New York, apparently he spilled the beans on the heroin distribution after being given cannabis. What about the science? As I mentioned, the Institute of Medicine in 1997 and 2003, prestigious group, published two papers. Mostly review because you can't do research, which we'll come to in a little bit. 
And after more than 30 years of research at that time, there were very limited randomized control trials, which are the standard today. They were short-term, 300 patients, but even then, indications, reduction in neuropathic pain, improves appetite uh, stimulation and caloric intake, spasticity. At that time, there looked to be better alternatives for chemo-induced nausea and vomiting. Similar indications. I'm not going to talk about the cannabinoid system. We'll let this go to the next lecture, but suffice it to say, it is far-reaching and modulating, and we know little about it. Maybe we'll know more after the next lecture, but there are receptors, CB1 and CB2. It was 1990 when these were discovered. Because of the repression of researcher, this is John Huffman. He is an organic chemist at Clemson University. He synthesized 450 different compounds similar to uh, cannabinoids. Of course, he patented them, and then they got out, and that's what K2 and spice were, these sort of uh, synthetic marijuana, which gave a lot of problems. Smoking by a delivery system is incredibly effective. High bioavailability, you intake it, it's into the, into the tracks quickly. It's a predictable onset of the effects. You can titrate it easily. Don't smoke as much. But we all know smoking delivers a number of other chemicals. And we've spent 50 years in the medical profession patting ourselves on the back saying how we've eliminated smoking, not eliminated, decreased it. And it's difficult to prescribe a medicine delivered by smoking but we don't have some other alternatives, although we will talk about a little of those. And then the research issue. You had to have approval of, approval of the National Institute of Drug Abuse. They weren't going to approve it if it had a positive uh, outcome for it. The FDA was never going to approve anything delivered by smoking. The DEA didn't want to approve anything. And there was only one place that you could get uh, research-based canna cannabis, which is Oxford, Mississippi at Old Miss. Apparently, in one of those uh, uh, new to the farm bill, they increased the uh, production. We do have FDA-approved medicines. These are, these are uh, synthetics, Marinol, Dronabinol, which is indicated for nausea and vomiting and also appetite stimulation, Sesamet or Nabilone, nobody knows about. But the interesting one is the Oric Mucosal Spray Sativex made by GW Pharmaceuticals. I have no interest in them. It's approved in Canada and Europe. It's in phase three studies now. Indication for spasm and muscle and pain and appetite stimulation. And it's an extract of the phytochemical. In 2015, last summer, Journal of American Medical Association reviewed the current literature. It was a systemic review and meta-analysis, a, a reassessment of the data, almost 80 trials. 6,000 people, big numbers, with the study selection looking at those indications that we've already met, mentioned. And what did they find? Most trials showed improvement in symptoms. Nausea and vomiting was greater than average. Pain, greater than average. Spasticity was average. There were common side effects. And what were the conclusions? The conclusions were that there seemed to be some benefits. What are my recommendations? First and foremost, we've heard it here before, get it off Schedule 1. Are you kidding me? I mean, that's LSD, that's psilocybin, that's heroin and cannabis. Are you kidding me? That's politics. And that prohibition sort of feeds the beast of the black market. We know that. There's money to be made. Um, that's not my point of view. But there's money to be made, and that's how things go in this country. And I'm okay with that. Research the therapeutic value of cannabinoids. Determine optimal routes. Smoking is not an optimal route. From a physician standpoint, you can recommend it. You can't prescribe it. This picture of the geriatric patient is difficult for me. Some would say, what difference? She may be older. She may be have terminal disease. And maybe that's true. There are edibles, which are beyond the scope of what today we're discuss about. They're interesting. Uh, there have been some issues in, in the Colorado experience, children, of course. Vaporization may be the key. Tinctures. In 1950s, this was an advertisement, more doctors smoke camels than their cigarettes, highly controversial today and criticized. This is an advertisement for a 
uh, Valuation Center, at least they didn't put the delivery by combustion on there. Probably this sums the whole deal up right here. The cover of Time Magazine, the highly divisive, curiously underfunded, and strangely promising world of pot science. Remember to share your knowledge. It's a way to achieve immortality. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Milton. Thank you so much. Next, we want to talk about the human endocannabinoid system with Stephen Kinsley, Dr. Stephen Kinsley, WVU Assistant Professor of Psychology. Hi everyone, thanks for having me out here and uh, special thanks to the, the organizers and Morgan in particular for inviting me to come over and talk about some of the work that we're doing here at West Virginia University. There's not a ton of endocannabinoid research going on you know, in the, in the world, although we're a growing field, it's an exciting time to be doing research. Um, but what I wanted to talk about today is just some of the work that we're doing, um, but more just kind of some overview of the biology of how the system works, excuse me, how the system works. I'm going to cough here. Although I guess there are three bottles of water right in front of me. Hmm. Well, anyway, this is um, something I want to just kind of throw up as far as my lack of conflict of interest, just to make sure everyone knows, and also more for the uh, more for the students when I talk to the undergrads to let them know that my lab doesn't have any pot in it, so no need. Although, um, as Dr. Milton was talking about with the the compounds I work with being Schedule One, we get a lot of oversight for these little tiny, 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 tiny amounts, but we follow the rules. Um, so yeah, I'm not, uh, not benefiting in any way financially from being here. I don't, I'm just here to talk about what I know. So thanks for having me. So um, just the way the pharmacologists kind of separate out uh, cannabinoids, there are three major categories. There's the phytocannabinoids that people know the most about, the plant-derived ones, so things that are coming from different strains of the cannabis plant. And so, uh, of course, um, you know, Delta 9 tetrahydrocannabinol is kind of the best known one because it's the one that we know has psychoactive effects and then there's some other ones uh, as well. And the way that things get kind of categorized as a cannabinoid has to do with the source or the structure being similar to something that comes from cannabis. So if you have a new uh, chemical structure that's maybe similar to THC, then that could be considered a cannabinoid. And then other people say, no, cannabinoids are things that activate the receptors. And so then cannabidiol is not a cannabinoid. And so then, you know, at the conferences we we uh, talk about that and maybe have a big tug of war at the end and find out who's right, I don't know. Different ways of categorizing it. Of course, the synthetic cannabinoids are mostly, uh, these are things that were created as research tools to try and figure out how the system works. And uh, John Huffman was one chemist that did synthesize a lot of these and has you know, gained some unfortunate notoriety as a lot of different um, unethical labs have gone in and uh, synthesized these things and sprayed them on grass clippings and sold it as incense and then bad things have happened to people. But it's been interesting to know that synthetic cannabinoids don't seem to be the same as the plant-derived ones. And then the group that I'm most interested in are the endogenous cannabinoids, or the cannabinoids that our bodies produce naturally. So, you know, so the analogy is really like endorphins. People talk about that with the runner's high, you know, how do we, why would we have a receptor? Why would we have evolved a receptor for some plant thing that we might smoke someday or something, or maybe some friend of ours might smoke? Um, it doesn't make any sense. So we must have something internally that would bind to that receptor naturally, and those are the endogenous cannabinoids. And so there are a couple that people agree on and a few others that people argue about. But um, to show a very busy and ugly slide and reiterate the point that Dr. Milton make, uh, marijuana is a really dirty drug. Uh, it has a lot of stuff in it. Um, if you keep reading down to the bottom, you eventually get down to the, the vitamins down there. So we got the, where's my pointer, there we go. A little bit of vitamin A. It's a really expensive way to get vitamin A, um, but you can. Um, <laughs> but, you know, from a science and sort of research methods point of view, a lot of people don't like marijuana because it just has so many different compounds in it. And so people will typically focus more on the THC because we know that one's psychoactive, thanks to uh, Rafi Mishulam's work in Israel back in 1965. So this is, uh, again, it's, it's nice. Uh, Dr. Milton covered a lot of things I don't have to, which is nice. No, it's great. Uh, this is just that kind of in a, a little bit of a timeline and reiterating also that way back in the day, there are records of people using 
uh, different forms of cannabis for different things that seem medicinal. Um, as you kind of come forward, you know, there's some breaks on the line um, as, as you know, time goes by, and then, yep, things become legal over here in the States, and then we discover, well, we don't. I wasn't really involved in Dr. Mishulam's work uh, back in the 60s. I wasn't very active as a researcher at that time. <laughs> but, you know, once we identified, uh, once scientists identified the receptors and start trying to understand how they work, and what's interesting is a lot of this stuff is happening very rapidly, and even though this is a compressed timeline, what I love about it is the stuff's all, a lot, you know, even though things were happening thousands of years ago, the research is all very new. And the ideas that there could be positive aspects to cannabinoids are fairly new, but there aren't a lot of research, uh, there aren't a lot of data to back it up yet. So just kind of talk a little bit about how the stuff works. Um, yeah, it's, it's uh, fine someone has a, a reputation for having used once or twice. Um, so, so what happens? Well, fairly well-known effects of, of uh, cannabis intoxication include this high and euphoria and, and relaxation. And so, um, so I think a lot of people are aware of those. And then also some of the other things that are a little bit more difficult to test uh, in people, like the um, cognitive impairments. Uh, a lot of people use not just one drug, which is often a problem with research in humans, as they don't typically only ever use marijuana. And also, just because of some of the supply chain issues, we don't know what it is that they're actually smoking versus what's been added in there. So um, some things that are interesting that I've heard about in the last two years, um, like the last bullet point talking about complex tasks, uh, an interesting study where they brought in people who, uh, some people think that they get better at playing video games if they're high, and so it's kind of an empirical research question, and so they brought people in and had them do complex tasks where they have to focus on more than one thing at a time. And that was the only thing that they were better at. There are lots of other things that they felt like they were better at, but they actually were not very good. But they could kind of be distracted and do a few things kind of OK at the same time. Um, so it seems to uh, be difficult to focus attention uh, while high. There are some other peripheral effects. And, and these are um, you know, kind of the basis for targets for medical use. Um, so as far as um, the third bullet point there, well, the second and third about appetite and emesis, uh, as far as you know, reducing nausea and vomiting and increasing um, eating, um, people have certain wasting uh, disorders, then cannabinoids can be good for that. And then the, the fourth one, which is, I'm just looking at it with regret now, because it's, it's way more technical than I wanted it to look, but it's about glaucoma, uh, that uh, researchers still don't really know how that works, but it seems to reduce the pressure. I thought it'd be a pretty simple, like hydraulic thing, you know, fluid in, fluid out, but it's not that simple, uh, apparently. So we're not really quite sure how that's working, but it seems to help reduce eye pressure. Uh, so if you look in research animals, we get a lot of the same effects, and so we can go through and, and look at, we get increased, uh, you know, eating and increased heart rate, and um, at high doses, they tend to not move around very much and, um, and sit in one place. Uh, but you also get a decrease in, in pain sensitivity and some of these other things that map on really well with some of the human experiences. Um, unfortunately, depending on the animal, uh, you can also get self-administration, which is not good. Um, and, um, and of course, that there are these kind of long-term memory issues as well. And sometimes we argue about the, the methods on those studies, um, how they do with the memory disruption. Self-administration is more of a thing that uh, monkeys do. Rats and mice don't tend to do it. So people will argue either way about kind of what that means. So, so how does this stuff work? Um, there are receptors, CB1 and CB2. So uh, I made this uh, cartoon to try and illustrate it a little bit. Um, anyone's taken like an intro psych class, uh, you may remember like this thing about neurotransmitters and they kind of go from one neuron to the other. Cannabinoids are really funny. They go backwards across the synapse. So, um, so what happens is you have, if this is a, you know, a dendrite from a neuron, this is the neuron that's talking to it. So this guy's dumping some neurotransmitter and gets bound by receptors down here normally. But endocannabinoids do everything backwards because they're just cool that way. So the two main ones are anandamide, and ananda is Sanskrit for bliss, and it's an amide, so that's why anandamide, and 2-AG, which doesn't have a cool name yet, but it's 2 arachidonal glycerol. So what they do is they travel backwards across the synapse and bind to receptors. CB1 receptors are pre uh, predominantly in the central nervous system. Uh, they don't seem to show up in the brain stem. And so brain stem is really important for things like keeping you breathing. And so one of the ideas of why we don't really have toxicity, why people don't OD, although maybe there's some technicalities that like, oh, you fell while you're high, but people don't tend to overdose on 
uh, cannabinoids because you don't stop breathing like you might do uh, on an opioid. So THC is going to work very similar. It just binds the same receptors. And it binds with pretty good affinity, and it stays there for a while. And so, um, and so the, um, the endogenous cannabinoids get broken down really quickly by enzymes, since that's why people don't walk around feeling high all the time. And so one of the approaches to research that I'll talk about in a second is manipulating those enzymes to drive up uh, endogenous levels of cannabinoids. So if you look at where these receptors are throughout the body, they show up in a lot of fatty places, kind of reproductive places. Um, you know, there's a lot in the liver has to do with the metabolism, but definitely in the brain and in the fat and the spinal cord and also in the stomach, which uh, I think is really interesting in some of my research. I'm happy to talk about some other time, but we're finding uh, in the mice very, uh, very potent anti-ulcerogenic effects. So uh, we take the mice and give them a high dose of, of like uh, an ibuprofen-like drug. Uh, it'll give the animals uh, gastric ulcers. You can give them very low doses of uh, cannabinoid, you know, CB1 receptor agonist, and they don't get ulcers. And we don't know how that works, and still trying to get that one funded. But interesting stuff. So kind of the big question um, that a lot of people are talking about right now, especially with the widespread, um, you know, more and more adoption of, you know, of more liberal cannabis laws, is are we really outpacing the data that we have? And, and clearly we are, because there just aren't enough studies we're relying on a lot of retrospective studies from Canada and other areas where legalization has been around for a longer time. Um, but, uh, but it's a tricky thing. I mean, it seems like you really have the two sides of the argument where people like simple things, and so it's often that, you know, marijuana is, is a, you know, it's a panacea. It's good for whatever ails you, and it's great, and there's no side effects. Don't worry about it. And then you have this other side of people that are like, drugs are bad, gateway effect, everyone's going to be hooked on heroin next week. And you think, well, that's weird. I know people that have smoked marijuana and are not on, uh, we're not a heroin team. So maybe it's a little bit overblown uh, on both sides. So I guess this is the second wordiest slide I have. Um, and part of the, the reason why it's so wordy is because researchers and clinicians really don't agree at all. Like, there's not a consensus on what addiction even really is. And so, there's a lot of kind of compulsive drug seeking and things that we think about in messages from the 80s about, you know, okay, yeah, this person becomes this drug fiend and they're knocking over banks and this is, this is an addict. But really, drug use is being seen more as a, as a continuum now, where you have some people that are, uh, maybe have a mild, you know, uh, a use disorder. And, um, and so cannabis use disorder has, has been acknowledged in the, um, you know, recently in the medical field as uh, in the psychiatric field as a thing, that you have people, and they're in the minority, who have trouble, uh, they have trouble quitting cannabis use. And it's a tricky thing, because you get into like, well, but most people don't. And you know, is it as addictive as cocaine? And again, it's like, well, no, most people could use it one time, and they're fine. Uh, but you know, because it's becoming more and more available, are we going to have more people that have trouble quitting? And so what, the things that seem to be clear, and again, I don't work with humans, so I don't really, you know, this isn't my area of expertise, but what seems to be clear is that most people don't uh, develop a use disorder where they're, you know, seeking uh, cannabis or just having trouble quitting using it. But uh, of the, you know, maybe 10% or so that do develop it, it's very difficult to quit, and it's, uh, there are other drugs that are easier to quit. Uh, than, than marijuana is. And this is something that I've heard backed up by uh, our colleagues over at, I figure which direction to point, but at Chestnut Ridge, uh, that you have opioid users that say, yeah, I can, you know, I'm kind of on and off again with opioids, but I can't kick my pot habit. I don't know what the deal is. And, um, and so then it gets, you know, we get into tricky areas with like social stigma and all that as well. And um, definitely people are electing for treatment for cannabis use. In countries including France, where cannabis has been legal for much longer, it doesn't have the same social stigma we have in the States. So where you have broader legal adoption, there are more people not being referred by judges, but people who are electing uh, to, um, to undergo treatment to help themselves cut back on the pot a bit. So I don't know what it means. You know, I don't think it's all good, and I don't think it's all bad. I don't have a strong opinion on any of this. But as far as uh, what we can tell from looking at at uh, people and also other animals, if you, uh, if you give them the drug for a while and they develop tolerance, they need more and more drug. And then if you suddenly take the drug away and they have an effect of having the drug pulled away, then 
from that, we say, okay, it looks like the animal was dependent upon that drug. And if they're dependent, then that can be part of this kind of cloud of things that we consider addiction. So some of the work that I do focuses on anxiety and depression, uh, big, big problems the world over. And I know a lot of people uh, that uh, have anxiety and depression smoke marijuana, they feel better, and that's good. And that goes on you know, for a while. And then the big question kind of comes from, well, then what if they abstain? And I think, again, most people are fine, but there are other people who will find that their anxiety and depressive uh, feelings will return or maybe be exaggerated or maybe they weren't there before. It's kind of hard to know because, again, most people are using alcohol and nicotine and all kinds of other things at the same time. But, uh, but what we can do to kind of get at this a little bit uh, more closely and is also uh, easier to get funded is to look at in research animals. So I'm not going to go into all the data here, but we, uh, we've done some work with uh, mice in my lab and other labs looking at these types of, of models where we will expose the animals to THC for a while and then take it away and then see what happens with them. And you know, again, there's caveats to that. They're not smoking marijuana necessarily, although um, different labs have the ability to do that. Um, but, uh, but we're starting to see this similar patterns in animals that we have in, in humans where they may have trouble sleeping, uh, and they seem to be more anxiety-like or depressive, right? And again, it's hard to know. Like, how, how do you know if a mouse is depressed or anxious? You know, there's models. And so there, there are limitations to that as well. I'm not saying that I, I, I do not, <laughs> I do not, I'm, I'm married. I know I don't have all the answers at all. <laughs> so. Um, so also, as Dr. Milton was saying, smoking anything is probably not the best idea. Uh, so as far as, you know, route of administration, smoking is great. It gets it in your lungs quickly. It's almost like an intravenous. It's just so fast the exchange through your lungs is, is, uh, is quick. It gets into your brain very quickly. But, you know, anything that you're lighting on fire and inhaling, you're going to get a bunch of other stuff with it. So uh, maybe don't do that. But that's what we know the most about because that's what people have been doing for the longest. The edibles, again, we don't really know that much about them. There's this whole, you know, big... A big push uh, with lots of uh, you know candies and things. They just add a bunch of THC and see what happens. And and uh, and also, I agree. I think that the people, the consumers, are, are the guinea pigs in a lot of those um, a lot of those a lot of those products. So the way that the research field is going is um, trying to get more cannabis, you know, marijuana work in humans, but also trying to get away from uh, using direct cannabinoids. So like the different products where you have you know. Um, like a long-acting uh, cannabinoid receptor agonist like uh, Kesemet uh, Navalone that Dr. Milton mentioned. Uh, as a, that's, that's one potential treatment. It's not FDA approved or anything, but that's something along with behavioral therapies to help people kind of wean off if they, if, you know, if they feel that they're using more cannabis than they want to and it's interfering with their lives. Um, and there's also the inhalers like Sativex that has THC and cannabidiol and a few other things uh, that uh, they're looking at for, for use in spasticity and, and, uh, and epilepsy and different things in kids. So as far as, um, you know, there, there are drugs that hit the other receptors. I'm not really talking about CB2. is not very behavioral. It seems to be a little bit in the brain stem, but it's not, um, it's kind of unclear. It doesn't seem to do a lot behaviorally. Maybe something to do with cocaine addiction in rats. So I don't know. But CB2 is potently anti-inflammatory. And so a lot of the work that different labs do and my lab's doing right now is working with drugs that do not hit CB1, except maybe at a very high dose. And so the idea is, could we get these positive things, the anti-inflammatory effects of something like THC, but that doesn't hit CB1 and doesn't uh, come along with the high. And so there's been a big push uh, towards CB2 selective agonists, and also towards CB1 agonists that will hit those parts that I, I showed in that earlier slide with all those bars on it, hit the different kind of fatty parts of the body, but don't get into the brain. And that's been very difficult to develop those drugs, and uh, the medicinal chemists are, are working on it in shifts, I guess. I don't know. Uh, but we hope to get those as well. And then the other angle, like I said, is to increase uh, the endogenous levels of cannabinoids by, um, by, by blocking them from being broken down. So to go back to my schematic earlier, you got your uh, endocannabinoids hanging down, come on, pointer, hanging out down here, uh, 2-AG and nandamide. And what's going to happen is they get broken down by different enzymes. So this one's fatty acid amide hydrolase, which breaks down uh, anandamide, and 2-AG breaks down, is broken down by mag lipase. Uh, monoacylglycerol lipase, but whatever. There, there won't be a quiz at the end, it's fine. It's, you know. <laughs> so, so what happens, and, and again, these enzymes very tightly regulate the endocannabinoids, and that's why we don't have a lot of them around. Uh, it turns out that if you 
you can block them selectively by using these different drugs that also have strange names because they're kind of named after where they came from. Uh, so this one's from a university in, in Italy, in Urbino. So that's a URB is for Urbino, and it's, I don't know, compound 597. Uh, so it'll bind to the Tha enzyme and then block an andamide from being broken down. So there's more in the system, more combined to the receptors, and you get a decrease in pain response and, and all that. And what's interesting about um, increasing anandamides, it seems like the animals do not become tolerant to it and they do not uh, show any withdrawal signs when you take it away, which is really exciting. Uh, the other uh, enzyme, monoacyl glycerol lipase, can get blocked by uh, this other compound, and there's, there's a class of them now. This one's named after uh, my colleague and friend John Long, John G. Long. So he's, if you come up with cool chemicals, you can name them after yourselves, uh, just like the John Huffman drugs of JWH. So JZ184 blocks MAC lipase, which then selectively increases 2-AG. So we can go through and manipulate 2-AG in anandamide levels. Anandamide by itself is very expensive. 2-AG is very expensive. And if you were to you know, eat some or something, you probably nothing would happen to actually be it. If you injected some, then you might feel an effect for 20 minutes or so, and then the enzymes would break it all down. So it's a very expensive way to, to get a high. So, uh, so we don't tend to go that way. So as far as kind of the way that the field's going, uh, it's, again, a really exciting time. The, uh, International Cannabinoid Research Society is a big group of researchers that get together every year. Uh, we're meeting in Poland in, in June if anyone wants to come along. Um, and there are a lot of different targets that people are looking at, and some of them seem to be uh, more promising than others. And uh, my little kind of personal plug here is just to highlight the ones that, that we're working on here at WVU. But um, again, you know, neuropathic pain seems very promising. Arthritis may be very promising, um, and then a lot of other kind of psychoactive things um, like anxiety and depression. And there's a lot of work looking into post-traumatic stress disorder, of course, because we have a big population with such a, um, such a strong military commitment in West Virginia. We have a lot of returning veterans that will, that will often um, self-administer, you know, kind of uh, prescribe themselves cannabis to help with the anxiety. But then the problem is when you do that, if you're also having memory deficits, are they maybe prolonging their PTSD by not relearning uh, that they need to not respond to, uh, to different things in the environment that cause them anxiety? So we don't really know. So that's all ongoing. But I think I'm going to leave it at that and, um, and, and move on to the next speaker. So thanks again for having me. Thank you so much, Dr. Kinsey. Just real quick. Housekeeping, does anybody have the sample medical marijuana card? Mike Mannypenny, okay, thank you. Let me get that back. Um, next, we're going to hear about the comparative analysis of cannabis policies from Adriana Bakery, a WVU Law class of 2016. Hi, I'm Adriana Faye Curry, and I'm conducting research in comparative bioethics focusing on medical marijuana policies of Israel and the United States. Israel's been coming up a lot, so now we're going to put it all together. Uh, British medical doctor, scientist, and politician Dr. Robert Winston said, it's important that legislation keeps pace with scientific progress. You're all here today because United States legislation has not kept pace with scientific progress of medical cannabis. Even though the United States Department of Health and National Institutes of Health have publicly, as the other speakers have mentioned, that there are medical benefits to cannabis. But, and yet cannabis is still listed as a Schedule I controlled substance. And they haven't really gone into most, we've talked about the history, but we haven't really talked about how we can get it from Schedule I to Schedule II or lower. So that's what I'm gonna help with. <laughs> In order to, for a controlled substance to be identified as having accepted medical use, which is under the Schedule I classification of uh, substances that don't have accepted medical use, uh, the FDA requires that clinical trials be conducted and designed in a way that provide the agency with necessary scientific data upon which the FDA can make its approval decisions. Now this is where it gets a little sticky and the bureaucratic red tape really comes out right now. The catch is the clinical trials that the FDA requires involves three federal agencies, 
First, the cannabis that's used for the research, research must come from the University of Mississippi. That is the only federally funded government scientific research center in the United States. It's the only one, and they actually also provide marijuana, or excuse me, cannabis to at least seven patients still, even though it is technically federally illegal. The second uh, department is the FDA. Uh, the researchers need to work very closely with the FDA to make sure that the research that's being conducted is meeting the standards that the FDA has set out. And of course, these are incredibly difficult standards to meet because if it was actually possible, cannabis wouldn't be a Schedule One substance. And the third is the DEA because these clinical trials have to still follow federal rules. But how can you file? How can you follow federal rules when the drug, or excuse me, the substance you want to test and try and reschedule is considered a Schedule One substance? So it's all cyclical and. We're kind of following our tail here, trying to uh, reschedule it. So in short, the hoops the federal government has in place are nearly impossible to get through. We already know that the United States unofficially recognizes that cannabis may have potential, I'm quoting, I'm paraphrasing, paraphrasing, has unofficial medical potential. They're not approving it, they're not accepting it, but they're saying it's possible. So let's do some research to at least verify our beliefs. Well, unfortunately, once again, federal bureaucratic tape, uh, the DEA, FDA, and the, um, and uh, I'm sorry, FDA and the DEA are still not working together to bring this substance to the researchers to be able to reschedule it. So I have a few theories of my own for why <laughs> the FDA and the federal government is dragging their feet, but we're not going to get into that, considering especially that Milan is right down the street. So infer from that what you will. <laughs> so while the United States will not take the appropriate steps to reschedule um, cannabis, Israel, one of the only three countries in the entire world that has federally funded or state funded research, has taken it upon themselves to be at the forefront of this movement. Canada and the Netherlands are also the other two. So in, 20, or in 2007, uh, within the Israelis' Ministry of Health, they decided to create the Medical Cannabis Unit. And you'd also heard that uh, an Israeli scientist was the founder of the endocannabinoid system. So Israel coming back again, and he actually started everything. He was the, the pioneer for uh, medical cannabis. The thing is, is that Israel still considers cannabis a dangerous drug, just as the United States does, keeping it under Israeli version of a Schedule One substance. However, the country is still willing to take that information that they know that there is potential for medical <coughs> cannabis and study it and research it to at least be open to the possibility of it not being considered a dangerous drug anymore. So how you, Israel handles this is the cannabis is treated like any other medication. It's prescribed and supervised like a narcotic medication and monitored by the same standards as those other medications. With, but the difference with the medical cannabis unit in Israel versus any kind of establishment in the United States with this, with individual states is that they actually have a system like BioTrack, and this is not a plug at all. I had no idea that <laughs> this was there. Um, but they do have a system like BioTrack THC that is a statewide database. All of the patients or people who want to become medical marijuana, medical cannabis patients have to apply to the Ministry of Health and they have requirements, very stringent requirements. Patients have to be suffering from a certain indication, that's what they're called, uh, typically cancer, epilepsy, Parkinson's, uh, pain, but there are certain also further requirements, like for pain. A uh, patient has to show that they have tried at least a year's worth of other pain treatment before they resort to medical cannabis. Um, right now, there are, current, there are 30, approximately 30,000 people who are legally allowed to receive medical cannabis in Israel. They're expecting that number to increase significantly. 
uh, those patients have, they have those indications that they have to meet, but then they also have to meet with a doctor and have to go through this stringent process with their doctor that shows documentation that they have gone to this doctor for this ailment before they decide to ask for medical cannabis. So it's kind of, you can't just go like in other states in the United States where you can just go to a doctor you've never met before, never seen, and he will give you a recommendation for medical marijuana. It's definitely more stringent than that, more regulated, because you are dealing on a federal, countrywide basis. Once the doctor consults with the patient, the doctor will then give the patient an option of only eight suppliers in all of Israel that support, grow, manufacture the cannabis that the patients use. This is all still in the database system. This is all within the Ministry of Health, underneath also the umbrella of the Medical Cannabis Unit. So every single point, just as was discussed with BioTrack, is highlighted and tracked. There's no way you can get around this system. So once the doctor is given the patient that supplier, the supply or the patient then will submit their application, pay the fee, and wait to hear from the ministry. Ministry, as you can tell, since there are only 30,000 patients, still very liberally rejects patients, but does give them a chance to petition or appeal their rejection and then further reapply. <clears throat> Excuse me. Oh, sorry. Once the patient gets approved, then he'll go to, he or she, will go to the supplier, and the supplier then will conduct many individualized clinical trials. So the, the, the supplier will be able to then figure out exactly what the proper dosage is for the patient. They will try edibles, oils, uh, any kind of avenue that cannabis comes in, and then they will also work on the doses. And once they figure out eventually what the, the dose is, that will be the patient's prescription that he'll be, he or she will be able to get. The patient will be able to get the prescription and does get the prescription through state-run hospitals. There are actually hospitals where they allow patients to smoke within the facility. Uh, nursing homes actually also have or allow their patients to smoke within the facility as if it was any other kind of medication when the nurse comes around in the cart. She actually lights it for the patients since <laughs> they're really old. Um, and then also Israel was discussing in January or in July 2015 about bringing cannabis into pharmacies, just like any other normal drug, allowing patients to get their cannabis the exact same way, but still using that database. The database that's still used for normal medications will also be used for cannabis. Now, also keep in mind, because this is a heavy, heavily regulated area, obviously cannabis, uh, the personal growth operations are not allowed. And there are fines and penalties for people who do not have a card who are smoking. And there are penalties for patients who do have cards but are personally growing their own cannabis. And there are also fines. <clears throat> um, and healthcare facilities actually also allow, um, they have their own uh, delivery system that comes to the home. So instead of the patient getting the cannabis sent to them, which is actually an interesting concept considering in the United States you can't send drugs or cannabis at all from across state lines. Um, you can do that in Israel. So the patients do have also another avenue of getting their cannabis. So I propose this to the United States government, because I'm sure they're around somewhere listening. Uh, keep cannabis as a Schedule One substance for now, but make a little note, a little asterisk that it's pending and we decide, or hopefully we can help them decide, the federal government, to bring in a process and a, a department like the Ministry of Health has established with the Medical Cannabis Unit. It's comprised of different departments, di different people from each department, the Israelis version of the DEA, Israelis version of FDA, it can go on, so on and so forth and bring that to the United States and conduct the same kind of research and the same kind of policy that you have in Israel. It's working, obviously, it's worked since 2007 and well before that. 
And now everybody, or at least other countries, are trying to mirror their kinds of policies to that of Israel. At least that way then, once the United States has these policies in place, they're using the patients as, I don't want to say test subjects, but researching as research and clinical trials. These patients can then have that information taken to the federal government as evidence, as proof that saying, hey, this works. Medical cannabis helps with epilepsy. It helps with my cancer. It helps with my pain. And that way, then, it circumvents that chasing the tail motion that I discussed earlier of needing the right hand to help the left hand, but they're not attached to your body kind of thing. So you're just going in circles. With the cannabis unit being in the United States, that would also help to bring in <clears throat> more projects and more establishments like the University of Mississippi. So instead of having those eight suppliers that Israel has, maybe we could have the United States fund these programs through universities and university research programs. It's still heavily regulated. The government will know where the patients are, who the patients are getting the information from, who they're being recommended, and it would be a huge biotrack kind of database. This is only a proposal, but I think it would at least be a more effective way to try and get cannabis rescheduled from a Schedule 1 down to Schedule 2 or lower, because at least then we can prove that there is an accepted medical use, and it's not just individually based, it's actually federally based after federal research from federal funding. So it's kind of like gone through the federal car wash and it's, it's up to the standards that the federal government has used for years as saying that other research hasn't been adequate enough. Now we won't, they won't have an excuse to reject us. Thank you. So much, Ms. Vickery. We're going to take a little break, 10 minutes, so everybody can stretch their legs. And we will want to ask that the next presenters just kind of meet in the back of the corner right there, okay? The next folks. Oh, yes, we are going to take some questions. And you, sir, I forgot your question the last time. Do you have a question this time? 12. Well, let's go with one. Do you want to think about it? Okay, question. Uh, I remember you were talking about research as far as the effects of uh, cannabis inhalation with regard to smoking. Um, did you have any research into vaporizing and what is the difference as far as the health effects are concerned with regard to vaporizing and smoking? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not aware of, of those uh, studies. I mean, presumably you'd have you know, fewer carcinogens going in with vaporizing. It seems like people have that opinion, but I'm not, but, but again, you know, getting into um, uh, some of the things that Dr. Milton said too, you know, evidence-based versus what, what we think are, you know, people's opinions. So, so far, as, as far as I know, it's, it's more opinion-based, but. I can comment. Mm -hmm. Last night I was at a, a residence journal club and it dealt with vaporization of nicotine. Mm -hmm. Now, you heat this to high temperatures, 260 above, some are even higher. There are problematic issues in the delivery system because you begin to break down the metals within the, the delivery device, and so there are all kinds of issues there. If you saw on my uh, slide, there was this bag, uh, which it brought into a bag and then was inhaled that way. But again, as the, research, the researcher says, it needs to be evidence-based, uh, and that needs to occur, but with the whole catch-22 here is it's Schedule 1 and it is so difficult. I'd just like to call people's attention to an excellent article I ran across in the weekly news magazine, The Economist, just three weeks ago. It's a uh, front cover, I can't remember the actual date, but it, it devoted its uh, feature article to the legalization of marijuana. And it uh, got a lot of its data from Canada which is legalizing it next year. It would make a very fine article to be read by some of our political leaders who need educating and con convincing. That's The Economist about three weeks ago. I have a, I, excuse me, I have a copy of that, the, my last slide, but I didn't want to go, I had too many slides. If I can find it, I'll show you that. It was uh, February the 16th, I believe. It's got a great cover. You, you're actually, 
correct. If I can just. I just want to add a comment real quick uh, in relation to what you were talking about with uh, the cannabis that's grown in Mississippi for medical purposes for research. Uh, if you take a look, uh, Sue Sicily actually did a presentation at the DPA, Drug Policy Alliance Conference in Washington, D.C. recently. I was there and I sat in on the presentation. And the same aspect with Canada as it is with America, uh, if you look at the product that's actually produced uh, for Mississippi, it's inadequate completely inadequate for any type of uh, testing or for any type of research. Uh, it's just basically the plant ground up in a, in a chopper and it's handed over as, as dust. Uh, there's seeds and stems and everything involved in that. We need to have a better uh, product for research purposes, something that's, that's a better quality. So instead of you know, the stuff that's grown on the street or, or, or grown in the backyard, we need something that's, that's grown in a controlled environment that we know what's being used to actually grow it. Um, so, I think as you walk over to get the next question too, just a, a follow up to that same comment. It's a, a critique from the researchers as well that we've been having this one strain with a very low THC, which is much more like what we had in the 70s. But you know, the, there's just been uh, more and more THC added on uh, around the world. People have just been selectively breeding to increase THC, and so NIH announced like it's about six months ago, within the past year, that they're now going to produce. I think five additional strains. So it's going to start to more reflect. Uh, so, but, but still, yeah, the, as far as what, what arrives it is, I can attest to that as well. It is pretty chopped up stuff. In this Economist, uh, the average Delta 9 THC concentration is 18% in the Colorado experience right now. Um, I got here a little late, so I just was hearing, I guess, the last part of your presentation, ma'am. Uh, I pretty much don't like this whole Israel thing. I had a medical marijuana card in Colorado. I much prefer that there's small businesses and grow operations and that people can grow their own and that there's an entrepreneurial uh, individuality where people can experiment and grow uh, marijuana to a better strains. I find that that works much better. I, I totally disagree with that whole Israel thing. That being said, I have a horrific pain disorder called complex regional pain syndrome, one of the worst. And um, I find that marijuana is very helpful for me and for other CRPS sufferers. I want to urge, if there's any politicians in this room from West Virginia, that you legalize marijuana, that you tax it, that you start small businesses and get us to a sustainable agricultural future. Thank you so much. Um, to your Uh, to your point, ma'am, uh, I do agree with you completely, but for the purposes of rescheduling marijuana from a Schedule 1 to a lower schedule, we actually have to show that there is evidence-based research to show that there is an accepted medical use. But I absolutely agree with you that it does keep the entrepreneurial spirit alive by doing it individually. So I'm not even saying to, do, to federally legalize medical marijuana but to the extent that at least have the federal government create a, a committee to be able to conduct the research so we can have it rescheduled. But to keep that kind of what you have in Colorado, I'm from Michigan, so I completely understand. Uh, the same no, no, yeah, I, I agree. <laughs> Mics. I think this, it was Dr. Kinsey maybe who mentioned the cognitive function um, and the abilities. I'm curious if there's any research going on right now um, to the opposite effect because from what I understand, chemo patients come out of there with their brain spinning and the minute they take a toke, they're straight. They could drive home. Without that, they can't drive home. Um, so is there any research going into really delineating that line between Right, like a cognitive enhancing Yeah, because it, you know, it might screw up some of us, but then the other people, yeah. That yeah, no, it, I definitely, it makes them normal. So. Yeah, I hadn't heard about, about that with chemotherapy. That's really interesting. Um, the, it, yeah, it, it ends up being trickier than it seems like it should be. One of the best known um, cases was, so I talked about the CB1 agonists, and that's you know, how, how uh, cannabis and, and a lot of these drugs work that people you know, kind of choose to use. They're also antagonists, so they'll bind to the receptor and then block it from working. 
And so one of the best known ones was a, a drug called uh, Ramonabant, which we still use as a research tool, but um, was never approved in the US, but was approved in Europe as a, as a diet and weight loss uh, drug. So the idea was essentially that you would block the munchies, right? So people wouldn't want to eat fatty things or whatever. And, um, and, to, and so what happened with it is it ended up kind of having some unintended consequences where uh, people did lose weight, which was the good news, but the bad news was that a lot of the other sort of positive things that endocannabinoids do, like lowering stress and helping you sleep and helping you forget things that maybe you don't want to remember, um, went away. And so there uh, were a dozen or 15 people committed suicide uh, that, that were taking the drug. And it's a little bit controversial, like what all was going on with them, but um, but it seems like um, that's been the direction that people have kind of wanted to go, is maybe block the receptor. If it makes you forgetful, then block it. That doesn't seem to be a good approach. So now some things people are starting to do is maybe uh, just alter the way the receptor is working and slow it down a little bit to maybe. Um, but but there's a, there'd be a huge interest in that, especially with Alzheimer's. And like you said, people with uh, that have undergone chemotherapy and have that chemo brain. There are some people working with this to talk about that. And yeah. Yeah, no, I'm really curious what's going on there. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great example of humans are not all Ford F 150s. <laughs> And that is why we need these comparative randomized controlled trials, because what you anticipate may be exactly the opposite. And in fact, we use this term idiosyncratic response, and nobody yet knows why. And there's a great example of it. But we need the research. Uh, I don't remember who it was that mentioned that they, uh, here in West Virginia, I'm Philadelphia, and been active in this for years. Uh, but the user looking to reuse your mind areas for cultivation of hemp. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably one of the worst ideas the state has had. Because does anybody have mentioned about bioaccumulism? That as as hemp the, sucks everything out of the earth, yeah, the including all the heavy metals? This will be our last comment. Let's just raise our hands for comment. Okay, so we're hearing so much about the need for research to get it off Schedule 1, but what is the research that led to it being characterized as a Schedule 1 to begin with? I don't think there was research. That's the it. It was belief. There, there was actually research, and the Attorney General said that there is medical research to back that cannabis does have it's not as bad as the Schedule One classification as it should be. As soon it was, as soon as it was released, actually, the Attorney General released uh, like a 20-page response to the classification. The question was, if I understood it, was that was evidence to support that there was significant negative effects of cannabis? Is that was that the question? Is that what you oh. were answering? Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, I think it was. Reefer Madness, the, ma the movie. <laughs> well, that's emotional, and that's belief-based. Uh, look, there are adverse effects. The, uh, we already discussed that. Look at the complexities of the neurotransmitter. It doesn't do one thing. No drug, no chemical does. But there was a lot of emotion in this, and there still remains a lot of emotion in this. We've got lots of hands up. I want to take this comment and this question, and then we'll uh, have our break, and then our next session will be on industrial cannabis. Uh, for those of you in the room, I did want to point out one report that was actually uh, generated by the Government Office of Accountability, uh, specifically to the DOJ, and what they did is they actually did a comprehensive report on uh, Colorado and Washington and the way the framework is set up there, uh, not only the effects, negative and positive, of legalization. Uh, so if anybody has ties in with the legislature here or has other officials that are looking to maybe put uh, legislation together for the next uh, period of voting, 
please give them a copy of the report. It can be found easily online. It's a PDF. Uh, it's a little bit lengthy, but it does explain in detail the effects that are coming from each state. So. Excellent. Um, going back to her question about um, what research was done involving to make these uh, negative effects, basically to schedule it into a Schedule One drug, um, there was a study done where they placed gas masks on monkeys and made them inhale cannabis continuously and used that result as their basis of that. And that was perpetuated by the Nixon administration and which she had said the, um, the uh, I can't remember the exact word, basically the official who gave a report against it as soon as it came out was shredded by that presidency's cabinet essentially. Um, but my actual question other than that would be where do you all stand on uh, delivery systems involving vaporization with concentrates as opposed to flour material? Well, I think we've addressed some of that. We don't know. Uh, it, 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 it cognitively seems like it would be better, but I don't think in 2016 that's where we are. We need to know evidence-based. And I know we hammer, 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 hammer. I have a researcher here, I have a clinician here, that's the world we live in, and when we're making recommendations, you want to have some evidence, and we don't want to have one trial where we gas the monkeys. You know, we want to have 6,000, we want to have 80, 6,000 participants in 80 trials, and that's what we need to find out. I have no evidence to, to make a recommendation on. I think it really does depend on the kind of system that's in place in terms of individually testing how a patient will respond to concentrates because they are concentrated, um, high THC content substances. So to see what kind of response an individual patient gets is where that whole concept of bringing in Israel's um, testing centers, their suppliers, and being able to document how each individual responds is imperative, especially for concentrates like that. So it sounds like there's a whole opening in higher education around research around this industry also. So we'll take a 10 minute break. See you all back in 10 minutes. Yes, I can get it approved. Yes. <laughs> please taxpayers, please help us. <laughs> <laughs> 